question um, relating to an issue that has been in front of the committee for some time. Um, in January, at, at uh, my own suggestion, at the suggestion of others, um, the chairman wrote to you, Mr. Wheatley, in relation to uh, concern about um, the levying of charges um, by HSBC on human credit cards raised by um, uh, a whistleblower called Nicholas Wilson. And you responded uh, on the 3rd of February with a letter that I've only just actually seems only just been circulated to the committee, and I want to ask you about that, if I might. If you recall this case, this is a situation in which um, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson had been acting as um, uh, uh, for a firm of solicitors, discovered that um, HFC and HSBC subsidiary had been levying these charges, um, and blew the whistle on it. And Mr. Wilson believes that the amounts of money involved may be hundreds of millions of pounds or potentially more than that, and that the numbers of people involved may be tens or even hundreds of thousands of people who are affected by these charges. Now, um, in the course of that, it emerged that DG Solicitors, which was the um, firm, as it was, a, as it was suggested by HSBC, the internal firm of solicitors, was not in fact a firm of solicitors. This was regulatory authority. Uh, confirmed that, contrary to their claim, this was not a firm of solicitors located within um, HSBC itself. And um, it also became clear in the course of the FCA's responses to Mr. Wilson and those around him that uh, the FCA had, uh, on one occasion at least, copied and pasted a piece of text from HSBC into one of its responses. You're aware of this? Yes. Um, and when this was raised with the complaints um, uh, uh, person within the FCA, um, um, uh, Michelle Broadhurst, she responded by acknowledging that that happened um, without actually um, any particular apology or acknowledgement of culpability. Um, um, but you'd accept that copying and pasting bank text into FCA responses to formal requests of innovation or uh, help is not an attractive piece of behaviour. It, it certainly would look odd, and it gives a very poor impression. I, I don't know exactly the circumstances on which, as you say, copying and pasting happens. But it's been embarrassment to you, though, yes, to have that. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I thought. Thank you for that. Um, um, now, in the course of the um, response, the uh, FCA said that uh, these charges... Uh, sorry, no. Uh, HSBC said to... Um, uh, uh, someone who'd inquired about this, that um, the agreements which had been reached with customers uh, gave HSBC and its subsidiary, or its uh, operating arm, HFC, the right to levy these charges. Uh, and that the fee was added after the customer defaulted on the loan credit card payments. But it was, it was subsequently discovered, was it not, that actually these agreements did not contain <coughs> that uh, provision and therefore this was untrue. This was, in fact, it was knowingly untrue. HSBC had in effect lied to um, someone asking a question by saying that these agreements gave HFC the right, when in fact it did not have the right to levy those charges. Yes. So um, then, what happened was that the OFT got involved. Now, um, in your response, or rather in the FCA's response from Karina McTee dated the 3rd of February, which we've just received. Ms. McTeague says that the OFT, uh, uh, when it um, took action on this, uh, imposed requirements, including that HFC ensure that its collection charges were set at an amount that allowed it to recover no more than the actual necessary cost. It reasonably incurred, rather than as had been the case, levying charges irrespective of any actual legal proceedings or cost incurred in recovering funds. You'll be aware of that. Now, uh, uh, and you, well, the Ms. McTee, you collectively have said, in light of the regulatory intervention by the OFT in 2010 and other factors, we do not currently intend to take further action on this. So from Ms. McTee's standpoint, from the FCA's standpoint, the fact the OFT acted on this in 2010 um, relieves you of any responsibility to take action. 
Well, the, the event happened before we had the responsibility for consumer credit. Um, and although I think it's true, is it not, that um, uh, those the duties have passed to <coughs> having been given up by the OFT yes. in relation to those areas. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and of course, um, the F FSA, your predecessor body, <coughs> was certainly in place at that point, and the general principle has been that you've taken over there. Yes. Okay. So the question is this. Did OFT um, assess any issue of illegality when it made these inquiries? Any question of legality? Of illegality or illegality, yeah. Well, Clearly, the fact that they um, required that HFC stop making these collections is indicative that they thought the, the collections were inappropriate. Um, they didn't take action, as far as I'm aware, on redress, and there weren't suggestions of fraud, as far as I'm aware, which I assume, therefore, that they turned their attention to whether there was or not. But given that they took the view um, that the um, behaviour stopped in 2010 and there wasn't, as far as I'm aware, um, a fraud investigation, um, from my point of view, that, that was the end of that issue. It's not something that the FCA would reopen. Uh, I understand. So they didn't assess the issue of illegality. Um, uh, they merely sought to stop the behaviour that they thought was in breach of rules. Um, they did not address the question of prior losses that had been incurred. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, but, but you would yourself would you not accept the principle, which you've adopted very much elsewhere, that prior losses should be recovered in cases where detriment has occurred? That's, um, after all, the principle that you've been using with all these other cases. Yes, um, and that would be, um, absent applying retrospective regulation, which is something we're very cautious about, um, we would look at redress if, if um, fault occurred under the set of rules that we've inherited or taken on. Um, it would not be clear in this case that we wouldn't be acting retrospectively if we had applied our current redress philosophy to breaches under the OFT rules. Okay, so um, your principles are in this area are three, are they not? That the principle should a person should not benefit from regulatory breach, that a firm or individual should be penalised for wrongdoing, and that financial penalty should be sufficient to deter the person who committed the breach from committing further breaches. Yes. So what I want to probe quickly is <coughs> whether actually you've discharged your obligations in those areas mm -hmm. as the FCA. So in the response that um, we received, um, uh, Ms. McTeague says that um, the FCA uh, will, uh, the focus of our regulatory interest will be on whether the subject matter of the complaint is a convention of regulatory standards. We accept it clearly is a convention of regulatory standards. Mm -hmm. That's true. <coughs> to which our range of supervisory and enforcement powers applies. Well, um, these are carried over from the FSA, and the FSA clearly had powers in this area, did it not? Uh, no, I don't think it did. Uh, again, that, that's the qu question of whether our supervisory or enforcement powers would apply, uh, our judgment is that they wouldn't. So, the, the, the question, uh, uh, and she also says, we'd consider the quality of evidence to support the complaint. What, my question on that is, what checks were made by the FCA to assess whether or not there was evidence to support the complaint? Um, well, we would have looked at the file, um, we would have looked at the evidence gathered. We would not have gone and done a de novo investigation to gather evidence, unless we felt, bring the face out, there was a case for bringing um, an investigation forward. Um, and, and based on the OFT's conclusion and the fact that there, there wasn't um, fraud action taken, we took a view that there was not a prima facie case for us to intervene. So, well, I'm Jesse. Um, so, if you just ask one, question. No, 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 I've got a couple more questions, Chairman. Well, you'd better brown ask them both together then. Just well, we're going to run very short time. Well, I'm, I'm way less time than you've given to us to go on here, Chairman. And it's, it's a very important ask, issue it's on very which, on which I've been seeing, if I say so, with the Chairman for some months now. Chairman, so I'd like to appreciate a couple more questions. It's a very important issue. Please Thank ask you. your remaining couple of questions. Well, I can do so a few interruptions with this way of doing so. Let's get on with it, Jesse. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so the question on this now is that's on the issue of, of fraud. Um, and, and my question, uh, so I, I want to just put in a formal request that the FCA will uh, make some assessment of whether or of, of what the detriment has been, an independent now assessment of its own as to what detriment has been and how many hundreds or potentially thousands of customers may have been uh, affected. But there's also the further question, which is what happens to the individuals concerned? who will now, 
may now have left HSBC or may now have left HFC. And um, you do clearly have powers in that area. Um, you could, uh, if you so determined, decide that these fines, which have been determined to be not, uh, not compliant with the available rules, which we know were, um, uh, have been found to be unlawfully uh, uh, received or, or levied, you could, you could now decide that the individuals who are responsible for those areas should be pursued in their new careers and potentially be subject to um, uh, uh, some form of restriction on whether they're able to practice in the financial markets now. That's perfectly within your power, in addition to potential fraud, is it not? Well, fraud is not within our power. Um, it is within no, our power. No, it is in your power. It's clearly within your power. It's just you delegate it to other people. We know this. On very shortly. Is it within your power or not? Well, we're not the authority for prosecuting fraud. Um, that's a partial statement of the case. I'm now pursuing the question of the individual's concern. Yes, and, and if, the, if the individual's concern were, um, in our judgment, not fit and proper, then we can take action to prohibit individuals from the industry. But there is a high bar to take that action. You ask if we would do an assessment of the detriment. The answer is no, we wouldn't. We've d taken the decision on this case that there's no further action for us to take. We have a multitude of other call on our resources, and I think it would be disproportionate for us to call over that something that was concluded in 2010 by the OFT with no further action at that point. Well, I'm speechless. Thank you for that. I know in the response that you say the FCA has the power to prosecute fraud. Well, um, OK, Could, can I reply with um, a legally drafted letter then. Okay. I just note that in the note that's just so gone round. Okay, okay. Well, well the chairman's pointed out that's not true. Well, I mean, let, let's in fact, see. It's, it's disproved okay. by your letter. Or, order, order. We'll, we'll see what the chief executive of the FCA has to say to us in writing. I think it's a very important issue that Jesse Norman has raised and indeed that the committee has been raising on his behalf in correspondence and we'd like to take it forward in writing and we may need to take further oral evidence on it as well. John Mann. 